you guys agree with me that God's glory is ridiculed every single day across the world, especially from non-believers? Actually, only from non-believers. It's ridiculed every single day, especially here in America. I mean, you see it on, on, on television, you see it in movies, you hear it on the radio, you see it everywhere in the secular world. You see people ridiculing our God. You see people that don't like our God and probably don't like us just as much. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you guys through three questions and I'm gonna answer them for you guys. Three doctrinal questions about God's glory and why it's undermined, why it's ridiculed. What? Okay, so the, 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 the first question is, how does it happen? That's a very basic question with God's glory is how does it happen that God's glory becomes ridiculed to the way it is now? Let me tell you, Jesus says it in John chapter 5, verse 44. If you want to take a look with me, John chapter 5, verse 44, when he was talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, we see in John chapter 5, verse 44, it says, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from only God? This is a process how God's glory is ridiculed. It starts with this. It starts with taking God's glory away from him and putting it in the place of man. That's where it begins. It starts with taking God's glory and glorifying someone else other than God. That's where God's glory is taken away. It's when you deprive God of his glory and give it to man. We just had a graduation, uh, you know, this week. It was great, you know. Um, to be honest, for me, I felt like there was way too much glorifying self rather than glorifying God. I feel, I, I feel like graduation has become a, a secular tradition. It's great, you know. It's, re it's representing that we finally finished high school but I feel that it glorifies me too much. I gave a speech today and everyone clapped, but I have to be honest, it wasn't satisfying to me because they were clapping for me. I think we need to clap for God more than we clap for anybody else. We need to clap in the name of Jesus. The Bible says to do everything for God's glory. For God's glory are we to do everything. So can you guys agree again that here in the United States, we've stopped glorifying God. We have traditions that don't glorify God everywhere we look. You know, like I said, it's on movies, it's, it's, it's in music, especially on the radio. Have you guys heard this stuff on 102.7 or 105.9 or K-Rock? It's rubbish. That's what it is, it's rubbish. I love, I love the stations, and there's very few that glorify God with their music and their ministry. It's hard to find a gem in the midst of a bunch of sand. It's hard to find a group or someone that glorifies God in the midst of people that are, that are not, because you yourself are ridiculed, ridiculed as well as the Lord Jesus. When we are ridiculed for Christ's name, God is ridiculed just as much. And Christ suffers as we do. So we have a choice that God has given us. He's given us the choice. He says, are you going to glorify me or are you going to glorify self? Are you going to glorify me or are you going to glorify this person standing next to you? It's a choice that he gives us. And I think we all here know the right choice we can make, and it's by glorifying God. Now see, when we take the glory away from God and we give it in the place of man, what happens then? 
What happens when we start glorifying man more than we start glorifying God? Well, first of all, it takes us further and further away from God. It almost produces doubt, misunderstanding, and eventually disbelief. It can cause disbelief if you deprive God of his glory. It says later on in John chapter 5, it says, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And now I take you to the second question. The second question is, where did this start? This shift of attention from God to man, where did it start? Well, obviously it started with us. It started with us being tempted, being distracted, and looking towards man. It's when we started glorifying self rather than God. And if we took a, take a look at the secular state of the world, we see a lot of tradition, we see a lot of things that oppose the Word of God. We see a lot of it. For example, I'm going to take you into the book of Genesis, but before I do that, I'm going to talk to you guys about two things, and that is the renowned evolution theory, and that is the other renowned Big Bang Theory and the creation theory. realize that the evolution theory and the Big Bang Theory are very toxic for one's belief and believing in these theories as a Christian takes the glory away from God because you're not putting your faith in the inerrancy of his word. You're not putting your faith in the uh, most holy and true word. So first I guess we'll start with the evolution theory and me personally this is just my opinion I believe that this disbelief and shift of attention of glory from God to man started with the book of Genesis because we just took out the book of Genesis and the gen and the book of Genesis is the basis of life for a Christian it is the basis of life if you look at our country right now if you look at many other countries they are farther than ever from God because we have chosen to believe in these theories rather than God's Word that is exactly why and various other reasons as well subjective feelings what have you but I believe part of it is from Genesis is from science versus religion it's because, of, it's because of theories like this that we have attacks on the book of beginnings. We have attacks on the book of Genesis. So, I want to take you guys to another part. When we drop Genesis, when we compromise Genesis, we compromise the rest of the Bible as a whole. And we compromise the Christian faith. How? Or do you remember John chapter 5, verse 46 and 47? Let's read it again. John chapter 5, verse 46 and 47. For if you believed in Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? These aren't just fables and stories, guys. For the longest time before I was a Christian, I thought this exact thing. I was like, the world was created in seven days, no way. No way, man. I was like, we have fossils and dinosaurs. Where does the Bible talk about dinosaurs? And I've recently found out that it does talk about dinosaurs as well. And I've, I'm going to share something with you later on about fossils. Not right now. But let's look at the things that Jesus spoke of according to the Old Testament that were true. Our creation of Adam and Eve. Or Jonah and the fish, Noah and the ark. <sighs> Many things. I won't read the verses I have here, but he speaks of these things as literal truth. Now, if you think about what Scripture says, Scripture says that God cannot lie. Scripture also says that in him lies the full 
deity in him bodily. Therefore, if Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, Jesus cannot lie. And when he talks about the creation of Adam and Eve in Mark 10, uh, Mark 10 chapter 6, he's speaking literal. When he talks about Jonah and the fish, he's speaking literal. When he talks about Noah and the ark, he is speaking literal because God in the flesh cannot lie. God cannot lie. Therefore, when we try to compare these two, science and religion, they don't mesh. It's like water and oil. They are distinguished between each other. Now, from the book of Genesis, we get a lot of important doctrine. A lot of really, really important doctrine. The one that I'm going to focus on is the doctrine of, of law, sin, and death. Because Genesis, in fact, is where we get the first law, the first sin, and the first death. Genesis is the basis for the need of redemption. Let's go to fossils so I can explain this a little better. Scientists claim that fossils are millions to billions of years old, far before way far before the biblical account of creation, which is roughly 6,000 years. So when you take these fossils and say they're millions to billions of years old and you compare it with God's word, you find that if this were true, that death came before sin, which is not true. If death came before sin, then sin does not cause death in which we do not need a savior to redeem us from it. If fossils came before the creation, before sin, and they were dying, and they were being what was put into the rock and they were fossilized, if that was happening before the creation, then there's no such thing as sin. But the Bible tells us that this is not true. Genesis chapter 2.17 tells us, But of the tree of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Here is where Genesis tells us the first law given to man, you shall not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This is the basis of law. Then we get the basis of death and sin, because the Bible tells us that sin is a transgression of the law, and therefore sin causes death as it tells us when when God was talking to to Adam and Eve he said you will die if you eat that fruit you're gonna die if you eat that fruit you're gonna die sin caused that that's what context tells us Romans 6 23 tells us that for the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus amen amen now, as we've compared this with the secular thinking about fossils, if you guys don't mind, I want to share something interesting with you about carbon dating. Carbon dating is pretty interesting. Have any of you guys ever studied it, carbon dating? I'm reading this awesome book, by the way. If you guys want to check it out, it's called Why Genesis Matters. I'm telling you guys, after reading this book, I feel like I have uh, more faith in God's word. I feel like... Like, I can give a defense to people who ask me about Genesis a lot better than I would have before. But it's a good book. So as we compared this with fossils, we realized that carbon dating, C12 is what scientists look for. It's carbon 12. 12 is the atomic mass number. With the, 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 uh, uh, gives us the amount of neurons and protons in a nucleus. C12 is in everything on their fossil record. There's also something they look for called C14. C14 is also in everything on their fossil record. Now, the thing about C14 is that it's an unstable carbon chemical. And over a 15700 year period called its half-life, decays into nitrogen gas. So, can you explain to me why C14 is currently inside of all these fossils? If they haven't decayed 
into nitrogen gas yet. This proves the account for biblical creation, meaning that these fossils are not as old as they say. These fossils are only about 5,700 years old, as opposed to millions and billions. So if you guys ever get into a conversation with a scientist, be sure to let them know that, because a lot of them will lie to you to ridicule God because they do not believe in him. At least 95% of them according to studies. Um, so, you know, we, we, we see that uh, we, we have this doctrine of sin and death, and we know it's true because many of you might believe that God's word is perfect and holy. If I can just give you guys another example of, of um, proof, I suppose, that the biblical account for creation is true in the book of Isaiah. It says in Isaiah 43, verse 27, your first father sinned and your mediators transgressed against me. Your first father sinned. That's what it tells us in Isaiah. The Bible is constantly giving us proof that, things, that, they, that these things are true, as are various other things, depending on what you study. So, Genesis, it's no wonder why it's attacked so often. Because Satan wants to take that away from people. Satan wants to put disbelief in the hearts of people about this book so that they're unsure about the rest of it. Right? If you're not sure about the beginning, about the foundation, are you going to be sure about what comes at the end? Or what comes halfway through? Or what comes three-fourths of the way through? Are you guys? Because I wasn't. I wasn't when I was unsaved. I was unsure. I was unsure of Genesis. It was because of the stories of Genesis. I was like, this giant ark filled with every animal. How are they going to fit every animal on there? That's bogus. Come on, you're playing me. This Christian guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? But when you guys were unsaved, if you guys were ever unsaved, well, actually, you guys were unsaved at one point. But while you guys were unsaved, did you, did you guys not ever think like that or question like that? Let me tell you, I probably questioned like that more than everybody in this room. I was the, 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 the what do you call it, uh, logical thinker, the Scientologist guy, the atheist, you know. But I realized that Genesis gives us so more than the doctrine of sin and death. So much more. So much more. Can you believe it? We even get the doctrine of clothing from Genesis. That's right, the doctrine of clothing. As funny as that might sound, Genesis is the reason that we have clothes. Sin is the reason why we have clothes, because we were ashamed. If we didn't sin, would we be ashamed? No. Because if we didn't sin, we would be, we would be a perfect being. God created man as a perfect being. But soon time changed that. So check this out. I don't know why, I just think this is the most interesting thing ever. But the doctrine of clothing, check it out, Genesis chapter 10. Come with me to Genesis chapter 10, if you guys want to. Or no, no, no I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. <laughs> My apologies. Okay, Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. It tells us, and he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. Because I was naked and hid myself. That is the first sign of being ashamed. And if we look in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, it says, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. So Genesis is where we get the doctrine of clothing. Can you believe that? That's why I'm wearing jeans right now. That's why, you know, everybody here is wearing a shirt and shoes and, you know, undergarments and all that kind of stuff. Genesis is why. And if you look, 
at another doctrinal issue, the doctrine of the seven-day week. Secular thinkers tell us that the seven-day creation, or secular thinkers tell us that the seven-day creation is not true, or you have this, uh, the pseudo science uh, Christians who say every day was an age, every day was you know 7,000 years or a million years, even then, that would not amount up to the billions of years they have it calculated at 4.5. Even then, it would not tell us. So we're actually, I'm actually going to tell you guys a verse in Exodus because we all know what it says in Genesis. It says, and on the first day, and on the second day, and on the third day, and fourth, and fifth, and sixth, and on the seventh, God rested. Well, it says that in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. And this time, it's not... It's, it, it, it's not just Moses' writing. It's Moses' writing about what the Lord said to him. The Lord said, and the Lord created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. And then he rested, or yeah, and rested on the seventh. And then he blessed the day, or he, he, he blessed the Sabbath day. The Bible proves itself. Another doctrinal issue is marriage. This very touchy subject here in America right now. Super touchy subject. You go out proclaiming he uh, uh, heterosexual marriage and you'll get ridiculed, especially here in Long Beach. I I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little afraid sometimes when I'm sitting next to a gay friend of mine and everything in me is just saying, tell them that that is sinful. But because, you know, I'm not bold, and I wish the Lord would help me with that. I pray the Lord would help me with that to be more bold. But because I'm not bold with that, I don't say anything. But it gives us the doctrine of marriage. Look at me again, or l look at this with me again. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Literally, the basis of the Christian life revolves around Genesis. It revolves around Genesis. So, if you decide to start thinking the way secular thinkers do, what happens to these things? Sin becomes a made-up thing. That's what happens. Sin is not real. But what happens when you say that? When someone says they're not a sinner, the light is not in them. They say sin is not real. They say not everybody's perfect, but sin is not real. There's no such thing as sin. Sin becomes a man-made thing. Death comes by natural causes. Clothes is only a tradition. The seven-day week is made up astronomically, and marriage is a tradition. What happens when we allow a country to redefine these things? God's glory is taken away. That's what happens. God's glory is taken away and people fall into disbelief and they fall into the temptation of the enemy. That's what happens when we compromise the book of Genesis. That's why it's so important. That's why I'm talking to you guys now because I know a lot of you guys are younger. Kinda. But I know some of you guys are younger, but I just, I wanted to share this because doctrine is an important issue. If we believe in God, if we believe that we're saved by His grace through Jesus Christ, then we have to believe in His Word. Word by word. We can't look at a verse and <laughs> make up some random things about it. We can't do that. We have to look at His Word, word by word. We are to believe what His Word says if we didn't believe his word then we have where does faith start what faith do we have if we can't even believe in his word so now the last question what can be done about this on our part only two things can be done on our part we can continue to give God the glory that He deserves. 
Oh, I'm sorry, we could do three things. But we can continue to give God the glory that he deserves because he is worthy of it. And we should uphold to the inerrancy of his holy word. Oh, I'm sorry, two things. <laughs> two things. We need to give God his glory. And we need to believe in his holy word. Now, practically, what can be done for others? We've gone over what could be done for us if we just continue to give God the glory and not glorify man for the things we do. Because everything that is done is controlled by the Almighty God. Everything that is done is because of the Almighty God. We deserve no glory. There's a verse in Isaiah that says, Behold, you are nothing. It says, Your works are an abomination. And it says that the deeds of the Lord are something. I wish I had memorized that verse. But the deeds of the Lord, let's just paraphrase and say good. W worthy even. The, the, de the works of the Lord are worthy. We have nothing unless we get it from the Lord. So what, we c what can we do on the behalf of others? Can any of you guys guess with me? What can we do on the behalf of others? So two things. Another two things. This time it's really two things, I promise you. And I'm about to close, don't worry. The last, thing we, the, the, the last two things we can do that are practical for us with these doctrinal issues are pray for these people first of all. Pray for these people first of all. Prayer is the first thing we should do before we do anything. If this nation is going to change, if the hearts of man are going to change, we need to pray before all things Rejoice in all things. Pray without ceasing. It is a commandment from God. We should uphold to it. The second thing we should do is tell people about Jesus. That's the second thing we should do is tell people about the Lord Jesus. Because even if they have doctrinal differences, faith comes by hearing the word. If they have a doctrinal issue and they come to believe in the Lord Jesus, things will change over time. Let me ask you guys, especially the older people here, you're much different than you were when you were first saved, are you not? Much different. A lot could happen in a year. A lot could happen in 10 years. Even more could happen in 30 years. Imagine eternity. How much will happen in eternity? But then think about the people that will be left out. That's the horrible part. Now let me tell you, these doctrinal issues aren't going to save them. These doctrinal issues are not going to save someone. The Bible says that justification is by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. Doctrinal issues won't save someone. But prayer will. Accept that person accepting the Lord Jesus and then praying for them will make a bigger difference than you could ever imagine because the Lord said in his own words, ask and you shall receive. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find and knock and it will be open to you. Let us start to pray for this nation to be opened, to be shown the light and glory of God and to reconcile with Jesus Christ and give him the glory. So I'm closed, so let's just pray. And uh, Lord, we just want to come before you this night. Lord God, I, I thank you so much that you've gathered us here. I thank you, Lord, that you have brought us to hear your word, Lord, and you brought us in, in, in your presence to praise and worship you, Lord God. Lord, I also understand that there are many doctrinal issues, Lord, all across the world with many denominations, many cults, Lord, many other things, Lord God, that are causing unbelief, Lord, but I just want to uh, ask you uh, 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 to just change this nation, Lord God. Change our hearts, Lord God, to put our complete trust in you, Lord. Lord, encourage us by your Spirit, Lord, to to lift up our, 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 our needs and our wants to you and the needs and wants of other people, Lord. Help us 
to, to, to do your will, Lord. Please make a difference in this country. Please make a difference in the world, especially this country in the Middle East right now, Lord. Lord, you are the only one who can make a difference. Lord, please allow this word to be uh, uh, manifest within us, Lord God. Lord, please encourage us. Please use us, Lord, for your glory. Do not allow self-glorification to manifest, Lord God. Please, Lord God, I'm asking you on behalf of myself and everyone here, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So Ishmael, it's your turn if you'd like to come up. <laughs>